Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we settle in for the final speaker of the evening, more people across America think they know more about our featured speaker than is true. Through the demonization of mainstream media, he was known by television viewers last week as the second most wanted man in America. You saw it. ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN. He was the poster boy for the militia. Even when law enforcement finally announced he was not wanted in connection with the Oklahoma City bombing. Those of you who have been following the program, the intelligence report on shortwave radio, also know an associate of our featured speaker tonight who's going to speak to you ever so briefly before we introduce you to the man from Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, the co-author of the intelligence report, Mr. John Statmiller. We ran a little bit long, so I'm going to make this real brief. Uh, as Mr. Portner said that there's been a lot of disinformation about a man by the name of Mark Kornke from Michigan. And I'm here to set the record straight. <clears throat> On the intelligence report, which the uh, show that I co-hosted, uh, we are at war right now as far as I'm concerned. This is the first casualty of war. We are off the air. And I've got to ask you a question. Why were we pulled? How many people in this audience heard the intelligence report. How many of you people here ever heard us expose hate, expose anti-Semitism, anti-black, anti-anything? I don't think one of you here can say that we have. What we did do with the intelligence report, it was a conduit. A conduit of such, it was interactive. George Will, on a uh, Brinkley report last week, said that the media, NBC and ABC, they have the papers, what the right-wing people have, and that's what he called us, right-wing people, <clears throat> excuse me, have talk radio. Now, there are a lot of people, there was a lot of consternation, a lot of confusion of what talk radio was all about. Talk radio was live. It was not the press. You could not twist it. You could not turn it. It was live. You heard it. Didn't have visual to it, but you didn't need to. You paid attention better because you used your ears and your mind. Well, there are still talk radio programs out there, but I'm wondering how long those shows are going to last. How long are we going to have free speech? It was okay when they attacked the Second Amendment because I didn't have any of those evil assault weapons. And let me remind you what an assault weapon is. It's a fully automatic military weapon. They are after the semi-automatic weapons. They are after the teeth of the Constitution of the United States of America. You, the people. It was okay when uh, we had the Fourth Amendment trouncing, the exclusionary rule, that just as long as law enforcement or police organizations thought that they were acting in a constitutional manner, that it was okay as long as they kept that in mind to violate your constitutional rights. We have Tenth Amendment refoundings. We have a lot of things taking place, but it became apparent to all when they start talking about talk radio. First Amendment free speech. So, briefly, there's a man here. I'm not going to take up any more of your time because the keynote speaker is here. His name is Mark Kornke. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy. And also, for the media that is here today, I, please get this straight this time. He is a maintenance supervisor at the University of Michigan. For the last many, many years, what we, he has done has absolute, absolutely amazed me. He worked a 40-hour-a-week job as a maintenance supervisor at University of Michigan. He did a radio program five nights a week. Every weekend, we were in a different city giving talks to people like you. And i got to tell you, he's probably one of the finest people I've ever met. So, I will not take any more of your time. I will just ask you this. If you care about free speech, 
if you give a damn about getting the intelligence report back on the air, and for those that did not hear the program, it was a very good program. It was instantaneous. We brought to the nation's attention Brunswick, Ohio. How many here heard of Brunswick, Ohio? Not very many. A few. What happened there was a travesty. 300 policemen and 200 firemen showed up to take care of a man and a nine-year-old boy that didn't want an officer coming into his home because he did not have a warrant. And the press reported he was espousing crazy ramblings such as, you're violating my constitutional rights. You do not have a warrant. You can't come in. Well, let me tell you what happened to this man. He's dead. This nine-year-old boy is dead, and he was buried last week because he said no. Now, I was going to take a little bit more time, and excuse me for getting this emotional, but in a couple of minutes, you're going to hear the evil godfather of hate, a person that's been doing a lot for the cause of liberty and freedom, and I think it's important. And I appreciate all you people showing up here today. Thank you. Join me now, ladies and gentlemen, as we individually make up our own minds about who he is or what he represents and what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark from Michigan, Mr. Mark Cornkey. First of all, this is a test for all of our friends and brothers and sisters in California. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Every time I've been here, for many of you men and women, thank you. You have been some of the finest hosts that we've seen in the nation. So I appreciate you a great deal. Let me start by saying something. All the armies of Asia and Europe cannot, by force of arms, take a drink from the Ohio River nor lay a, lay a track upon the Blue Ridge Mountains. If this nation is to fall, it shall fall first from treachery from within, and then force of arms from without. That was a quote from the American Civil War. And the Europeans and the Asians knew full well with the people that they sent that the American people were a force to be reckoned with. Ladies and gentlemen, I have never seen over the last 12 days so many barefaced, outright, rotten lies in my life, and the media was responsible for it all. I think a better way to vote is to do this. Do not buy their papers, shut off their programs, sell the cable station. And that will work because, as you know, just as we did with the intelligence report, I challenge you to do this. Do not cower. These knees buckle for no man on earth. Stand proudly as Americans. Look another man and woman in the eye and tell them exactly what you have seen and what you have witnessed. Go beyond all of the controls and the mechanisms that are there. You demonstrate your strength. I have had the blessings along with John that few people have had in the last two years. I have seen the American people, black, white, Asian, and that mongering about us being supremacists or racists. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm part of heard American and Indian myself. When I hear this filth and this crap, excuse me, coming out of these people's mouths, the bottom line is this, that you are going to be the test of the medal of America. You, not me. Time and again I have challenged you, if I fall, who will pick up the flag? I ask you here now, if I fall, and it is very likely it will happen, for there's only one other step left, if this does not succeed with the smear in the media, who here in this room will pick up the flag of liberty if I fall? The 
And ladies and gentlemen, one way or another, the Republic will be safe, as I have said a thousand times. And my concern is also for every one of you individually. I do not care who you are, and you've known this for a fact. How many homes have we come to? How many cities have we visited? Not even the federal government believed it. I watched their face fall because they could not understand and they cannot comprehend the commitment that we have to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights for all men and women in this country. The fact of the matter is this, that we are so close to a storm that is great and terrible and yet perhaps necessary that this was a last gasp, as many other actions that I'm going to talk about here tonight, a last gasp to try and push away freedom, liberty, and in fact the truth which is coming to bear across the nation. And there is nothing that can be done to stop it because now Americans are learning to talk to each other. That was the fear of the intelligence report as much as anything else. And you notice I talk about it in past tense, but it's not dead. Many of you know the techniques and the technology that we've employed, and much of it is not identifiable. And you will continue to go full force forward with focus with your eyes on the objective, which is to preserve the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And you know that I've sworn, if need be, to fight to protect it. And I will not back down from that ever. I asked many times of this, and you've heard it read on the air, but there's a reason because it is so crucial now. All the material goods that we have, ladies and gentlemen, will mean nothing if chains are laid upon our ankles and upon our wrists and we become slaves in our own home. Many years ago, people said, I heard it myself when I was this small, when I was much younger, I'll fight when they get to the borders, oh yeah, and then when they got to the borders, I'll fight when they get to the state, and I'll fight when they get to the county. And boy, when they show up in my town, we'll be there to stand up to them and push them right back out. And then, of course, it was to the front border of the property. Then it was to the front door. And finally, now what most people have decided to say, and I won't say all, but a lot is, well, as long as you leave me the beer and the television, you can have everything else, including the kids. The beer is running out, ladies and gentlemen. Bottom line is this, and you've seen it in California, but it's throughout the nation. When somebody said, what do I fear? Ask me this, what do I fear? I fear nothing now. You can get to a point where once you realize what your enemy stands for, fear has no part of this equation. It cannot. If eventually I fall, one of you will pick up the flag because all of you have the same spirit, the same heart that every man and woman that I've seen here today has. You just have to realize and understand how to touch it and find it. The Constitution is our property, ours, not the government's, not to be manipulated. Not by a president, not by Congress, not by the House, not even by the judiciary, if it violates the body of the law. And you're the final decision. You make the final choice, freedom or slavery. Is there any doubt in your mind when you look at what you have seen in the last two weeks that there are great orchestrations afoot not only in America but across the globe now? You've already been told that you need to surrender your rights. I'll surrender to no man. I'll take my chances with a criminal any day in front of me as opposed to Big Brother over me, period. Here, here. An interesting point is this. As an American citizen, I should not be trusted with arms, but if you give me a black fascist suit and a ski mask, then you're allowed to stomp on any American you wish. I am fascinated. Then I'd be acceptable, wouldn't I? Because all you would see are the eyes. And what have we said before? Why is it that's all that's allowed to be seen? Because the eyes are the wells of the soul. And many of the people and creatures that we face, that's the only term I can use for some of the butchers that we have seen, that these creatures, given the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, will work with reckless abandon if the chains are not kept in place. For all of you, I care not where you come from, from the inner city. Many of you know we've gone to the cities and we've gone to the country. We've been to 44 of the 50 states of the Union in less than a year. Do you realize how much traveling that is? We have exhausted ourselves intentionally, both of us, and many more who have traveled with us intentionally because we knew that time was crucial. And the hopes that planting a seed that every one of you, I do not care where you come from, but every one of you would then turn to another man and woman and challenge 
to stand up and ask, do I wish to be free? That's the choice. Are you a free man or woman? Pity the poor, wretched, timid soul who is too faint-hearted to resist his oppressors. He has the intellect of a slave. He sings the song of the damned. I can't fight. I have too much to lose. I own too much property. I have worked too hard to get what I have. They will put me out of my business if I resist. I will go to jail. Yeah, well, congratulations. We all will anyway. I have my family to think about. Well, we all have families to think about, even if we are alone. This is our family here, ladies and gentlemen. Such poor, miserable creatures have misplaced values and are hiding their cowardice behind pretended family responsibilities, blindly refusing to see that the most glorious legacy that one can bequeath to posterity is liberty, and that the only true security is liberty, period. That piece sits in front of my desk every day, and it sits in a book that we used with this program for a reason, to remind me, to slap me every once in a while so I didn't get into a melee of some kind. Because, ladies and gentlemen, do not despair. Trust me on this. With all that we know, do you not think I have had the opportunity time and again to despair? For what you see is but this much, and what we get to see is the rest of the picture. Now is not the time to buckle. Now is not the time to throw someone to the wolves, for trust me, ladies and gentlemen, the wolves will be hungry anyway. A friend of mine said it properly and said it only a few days ago. He said, even muskox have brains enough to put their butts to the center and shoulders side by side and horns to the outside. What is wrong with you, America? Think about it. We have, many different diff we have many different variations on the theme of what we call an American, but there is one common trait that we have said from Louisiana to Connecticut, from California, yes, to the Rocky Mountains, and to our brothers and sisters across the ocean, to our friends to the north and our many friends to the south, and that is this, we have a common bond. We want freedom and liberty, but we want it with our sovereignty intact. The best weapon that we have had is word of mouth because the press lies. I know for a fact because I can demonstrate to you and I will give you the best example. I was the second most wanted man in the United States, wasn't I? Yeah. Thank you. Well, that was continued along with many other bits of information for how many days? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know for a fact because we were in contact with law enforcement all during that time, in fact, I sat there when some of the calls came in to the, to the county sheriff's department and many others, because I wanted to know if there's a problem. I don't want to see people killed, because I know the feelings of many Americans out there. Do you want to talk to me? And they said, no, nobody has any interest, but the press certainly does, and they are lying through their teeth. And that was the sheriff's deputies themselves. They said, one good thing is this. For the days that they lied, they kept calling into the sheriff's department, and every time you call the sheriff, it is tape recorded, ladies and gentlemen. We can document that for three, five, no, eight straight days, they knew what they were doing. So then you have to ask yourself a basic question, who is behind this? Is it government per se? Well, I'll warn you about something. We have had the blessings of traveling around the United States and meeting many men and women, and yes, some of them are in government, some of them are in the military, many men in uniform. Not all are bad. In fact, not, very, not the larger percentage, just the reverse. There are men and women that swore to protect and defend the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, just as many of you did when you were in uniform. And they are worried because you know what they say? They are willing to stand, they are willing to fight this tyranny if it attempts these actions that are being proposed, but it needs to have you next to them. Not behind them, but next to them, because we must all stand side by side as Americans. Even in the great state of Oklahoma where this tragedy took place, and I put a big zero question mark next to it because I do not know what the, for what the full story is yet, and neither does anybody else. The Oklahoma House of Representatives. Now remember, we're all crazy for knowing about the New World Order. Well, this is an official record. 
the Oklahoma House of Representatives Anti-New World Order Resolution enrolled House Resolution number 1047. It was sponsored by Monks, Adair, Apple, Breckenridge, Caldwell, and another 30 men and women of the state of Oklahoma who believe that yes, there is a new world order and that that is their attempt to take and usurp our sovereignty, our constitution, and our Bill of Rights. And it was signed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, received by the Office of the Secretary of State this 29th day of March, 1994, at 1.29 o'clock. One of the lines which is most important to read is, whereas global government would mean the destruction of our Constitution and the corruption of the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, our freedom and our way of life, now therefore be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the second session of the 44th Oklahoma Legislature that the United States Congress shall cease. And there's a whole list of activities against the New World Order. Ladies and gentlemen, the manipulation and also the parties behind the scenes, we cannot put a name on yet. But I will tell you this, the satellite feeds were all taped, weren't they? And gradually, we will see all of the other parties. We will know all of the other names. And I will not say it. As you know, when I've been in any work that I've done, I have made a point of being very patient. And I've also asked all of you, how many times have I said this? Not reaction, but response to think and to stay your hand and use every peaceable means at your disposal. Eventually, the truth will be known. We will find all the parties who created all of the disinformation. Trust me, I am very patient. If it would take years, we will find them. And then we will use all the devices at our disposal. And the courts are many, I understand. Yes. Apology accepted, Admiral. Well, what is my greatest concern? And it is not a fear because I do not fear the enemy. And we have looked into their eyes and I know now that we most assuredly not only hurt them but may have crippled them in ways that you might not have imagined yourself because you were part of this. One of the aspects of it, and I want it written down if you have notepads, the Conference of the States, ladies and gentlemen, is my greatest concern at this moment. Not the pickle smoke that's being created in Oklahoma City, but an attempt to throw out the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States. How many here knew anything about it? Thank you. And how did you find out about it? Thank you very much. Did the press report it? No. Thank you very much. And why not, I wonder? Hmm. Well, if you'd like more information, let me give you an idea. The Conference of the States was a concealed con-con. The attempt was made before March 20th to try and sweep across the country all 50 states of the Union simultaneously. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you have grown gray fighting the con-con in the United States starting back in the 60s or the 70s and maybe even before. And even you can admit this was the most concise, effective attack on the Constitution so far to date. No one had seen anything like it. It swept through 10 states in less than seven days. It would have created independent corporate mechanisms at each state that would have gone to a conference of the states in Philadelphia to demand a con-con. They would have thrown out the Constitution and Bill of Rights, brought in the New States of America Constitution. If you need some of the information on the numbers, in New York it was J79, Bruno. In Texas, HCR18. In the Dakotas, SR82. And also in, for instance, Pennsylvania, HR30 and number 30 is a Senate bill. The Council of State Governments and ACIR, A-C-I-R, sponsored it. A-C-I-R. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could find it with the limited resources that I have, I guarantee the press could find it too, and they failed to inform you of a threat to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that was overt. We have enough documentation, and many of you helped to correct it and find it so that we can demonstrate the entire action, how it came about, who sponsored it, how much money was spent. That's right. Remember, your Constitution is now for sale. Yes. And because of these efforts, because of these attempts, we fortunately were able to flag and identify. And what did we do systematically? We helped you to identify which state was in trouble. We focused our resources, and I told you to step away when you were done. Economy and force is the fear that our enemy has because you are learning to become a power unto yourselves. That's important because you made the decisions here. 
One of the things that I can see now that we must fear more than anything else if we are going to have any fear is that someone's going to try and talk us out of that flag. That through the concept of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, they will create the problem, demonstrate the problem, and come up with a solution otherwise none of you would have accepted. Now I ask you to look around today especially. I've heard all the digs and all the snide remarks and all of the different comments that were made about what type of people make up an action of this type like a constitutional meeting or a constitutional issue meeting or even a militia meeting. And we've been around the nation and we have met all people involved, young and old, black and white, Asian and American Indian, ladies and gentlemen. We've had representatives in Denver from virtually all of the community and the American Indian tribes and all with the same concern we may become slaves, what do we do? Well, I'm going to ask you something today that I asked them to do, and it's the exact same thing that needs to be done around the country. You need to look next door right now. Look around you. Look at the people that are here. The ones that are listening even in the other room and are in the same situation, you're the solution. Not power from above. Don't expect a solution to trickle down from above because that's where the corruption is right now. It is centered in Washington, and it is centered in several key mechanisms at this time that feel a window of opportunity is in place. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to stop them, yes or no? Yeah. That's what needs to be done. And it's a simple word. Also, there's another one, remember we talked about before, that every two-year-old knows better than we do. No. With regard to surrendering our freedoms, no. With regard to surrendering our nation, no. no. With regard to surrendering our children, as we have seen here, no. Yeah, not yes. I see many young ones here, and ladies and gentlemen, how many times have we suggested this in the past? See, this is what they're afraid of, is what we're asking you to do is work together. We work together from the ground up. That's what scared the other side. That's why we're off the air, and there are real neo-Nazis out there that are on the air. Bottom line. Anybody who listened to my program and John's program knows exactly what we were about and exactly what we were talking about. Fact of the matter is, the other characters are still online. What we were doing was factual, was timely, and was effective. And that's why we had to be demonized, because after the fact, ladies and gentlemen, we had to be squashed and crushed and pulverized. Problem is, they had a script in advance. Let me give you an example. While we were in Michigan, I was watching cable as the original bombing was developing and then eventually the situation in Decker. I watched Newsman, who started to read, and we have this on tape. He said, the attack on the Dexter House, Dexter House owned by Mark Cornkey, and he looked up at the camera and he went like this. The inspection of the Decker farm, in, or the, the farm in Decker will continue. Now how, if this was an out-of-state report, would they have an information packet already telling you where Dexter, Michigan was, when there's a Decker and a Dexter most assuredly, but you wouldn't know the difference if you're from outside the state. We saw bits and pieces of this all over the country. This entire operation was most assuredly orchestrated. And in fact, it was orchestrated not from just the government, though some people in the government were involved, but other people behind the scenes, behind the media. I ask you to lift that rock up and see where the bugs are right now. Find out who they are, ask who it is. When you see a report, especially what we've seen the last two weeks, find out who's behind the person who wrote it. Then find out who owns the paper. And eventually you can draw the lines back to figure out who's who in the zoo and who's involved in this manipulation. And then again, as I said, why are you buying their papers? Why are you providing the enemy with resources? Why are you giving them money? From this point on, it should be word of mouth that anything that we can identify as opposition with regard to the media should be shunted. You have no need to talk to them, by the way, because what are you going to get from them other than editing? I could, sp I could speak for two hours here and you'd see five words, and it'd have nothing to do because they'd be out of context with what actually was talked about for the last how many hours here in this room. You now get to choose. A friend of mine said this, and I think he's accurate, they blew their wad on this one because they had to crush us. They had to crush the Patriot Movement or try to at this desperate point before it comes to blows to try and pariah everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, the militia and the Patriot Movement are one and the same, and you had best not try to separate them. To throw a baby from the carriage will do you no good. They will eat you anyway. 
I saw this several times over, comments were made, well, what about the Michigan militia? You were a member of, ladies and gentlemen, I'm always a member of the Michigan militia, the unorganized Michigan militia, and always have been, but we're not a member of the Wolverine group, and never have been, by the way. That was an outright lie. We helped to organize them, as we've helped many of you to organize across the country. Again, deception, and because a few people thought they could make a deal with the devil, they got them to try and throw a few words out to compromise, and those were completely turned around. And then they turned 24 hours later on the very people that they used. And yet again, to other people who did the exact same thing, doesn't that demonstrate something to you, especially since this is so firsthand across the nation? Since all of you experienced this, not some of us, all of you, because we saw this all over the United States. Well, that should also send up whistles and bells because what that means is that this is a supreme effort for the other side. We're in a race. How many times have you heard me say this? We are in a race, and it is a close one, but we have just as much of a capability as win of winning as the other side. We have just as much of an opportunity, and ladies and gentlemen, to win, we need not be a whole lap ahead. We need only be three steps ahead. That's all. Winning means this, we're defending. First of all, there is nothing that the New World Order has that we want. There is nothing that we have asked to take from anybody. In fact, just the reverse, it is the demand of the New World Order crowd, the elitists, the globalists, whatever term you want to use, to take from this woman, to take from this man, to take from that gentleman back there. In fact, you've been fighting a purely defensive war for so long, you wouldn't know what the word offense meant. And that's a fact, you've been holding ground. But there is one good thing, remember, about any martial art that you should remember from history, too. The attacker must subdue and destroy. The defender need only survive. We hold this piece of real estate, ladies and gentlemen. We hold it as free men and women right now. If you wish to pass that legacy on to that young child that's in your arms back there, or to the young children that I've seen here in the audience today, then you better stand up now and show them what it is to be an American. You better be willing to demonstrate by example and not to hide. Most assuredly also to point out what it is you've got in the way of bugs under the rocks here with regard to the media and also government because remember, many of those are hand in hand, foot in foot right now and they were being manipulated one by the other. Pay attention to the faces, pay attention to the names and remember them for the future. And again, make them unemployed, please. That's the best thing you can do. The one thing I will say is this, I have never seen a dog interviewed in my life, but my dogs were interviewed on national television. <laughs> it got to no, so nonsensical that while the press was busy, I like to call this, the guys kind of laughed this morning, I call this the guppy syndrome with like my cats. They were so busy watching the house that I drove by five times and waved. <laughs> I'm not lying. We had 150 yards worth of media and I drove by, waved. I was thinking of going and getting food when it was being catered just to see what would happen. <laughs> yes. A gentleman from the Boston Globe who came in and said, I just delivered a bunch of pictures to my paper of Mark Corky, Mark from Michigan. I was sitting there with a duty sergeant and a corporal and I'd just gotten through asking the sheriff, is there anybody that wants to talk to me for the 20th time? Well, the one corporal got up and set the guy from the Boston Globe right next to me this far away and the guy for 25 minutes kept talking about Mark from Michigan and Mark Cornkey with me standing spinning distance away from him. He finally went outside and the deputy went out with him. He came back and he says, Mark, I want to tell you something. I think he knows you might be him and he's wetting his pants right now. I've seen a lot of examples of this in the past, and a snafu is a word that comes to mind with the military, with the government, etc. And don't worry, there'll be some corrections this next time around, but I think John probably said it best, and he didn't say it when he stood up here. John gets very intense, and we're kind of balanced, so we balance each other out. Myself, I have taught you many things, I hope, but one thing is patience, because eventually everything will be shown for what it is. And if you really, if there is somebody out there who truly feels that I am a racist, that I'm a separatist or a supremacist in any way, I want you to step forward right now, please. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me that. 
because not one of these cowards would do that otherwise, other than with print edited or on the tel on a television screen half a million miles away, that's why. Because I'd, re I'd reach it and probably pull out their tongue. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, I've served with many good men and women of, from all walks of life. I've had the advantage, as I said, of, of speaking to so many of you that it is an insult that the media has done what it has done, and you know it too, so stand up and tell people. You're good men and women. I know it for a fact. We trod a lot of miles. We flew a lot of planes. We put up with a lot of nonsense. We lost a lot of sleep. We've spent our lives away from our families because you're all part of our family. If you don't think it's important, then I, I beg you, I ask you now, please, if you won't do it for anybody else, do it for yourself, but stand up. They're going to get one shot at this one. This storm, and I've talked about this in the past, is now upon us and the clouds are overhead, ladies and gentlemen. It is a terrible dark storm indeed. I've, I said this to a person on a plane while we were coming out here, a woman I talked to for three plus hours. It was like giving a regular presentation. But what she asked was this, she goes, well, well, don't you think that, do you think that there's a way we can come up with a peaceable solution? And I told her, yes, I do, but I'll tell you something. What it means is that every person in this plane would have to get up off their dead rear end and actually use their vocal cords. It means that all of you and all of us must be participatory in government now. Not waiting for someone else like Mark or John or Frank or Fred or Bill to tell you to do it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the great renaissance of America or it shall be the darkest years of, the Amer of American history short of the American Revolution. Decided by you in your suits, by you, you in your leisure clothes, by you in your work clothes, it makes no difference. The juggernaut that we face called the New World Order is in motion, and it is a terrible creature indeed. It has no respect for our Constitution and Bill of Rights. And I keep referring to that, and I've noticed the press and their attitude, which is very interesting. Uh, like, I believe in a literal interpretation of the, of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Yes, I do. Thank you. That's why they can still have their cameras, still have their notepads, and we can still do what we're doing because of the First Amendment. But let me tell you a little story John didn't relate. A Pennsylvania editor he called up because he was tired of, he talked to for about two hours, and one of the first things the guy said is, show me where it says I have to respect and honor the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. This is a man in the press, and this is an attitude I've seen across the country because I've talked, spoken to three separate people who said the exact same thing to me. Under the protection and guise of the First Amendment, they would assist in the destruction of the rest. Washington, Franklin, Jefferson, and virtually all of the other founding fathers warned of this and so many other perspectives that we must worry about and we have to pay attention to. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are the final watchdogs. And yes, if need be, you had better be armed because eventually this Byzantine corruption will continue to such a level that this nation will be unrecognizable from what was originally established. But you again are going to have to stand up for it. Nobody can win another man's freedom. People have been trying to tell you that we can do that for how many years, getting involved in wars with other people that most assuredly deserve freedom, but they must stand for themselves or they shall not stand at all. And you cannot go in and, spread, and, and, and spend your precious blood to try and do that for somebody else because the price paid is not ever appreciated. As a little homework assignment today, which I would ask you, I would, I would please ask you if you can find it in a library today, George Washington's farewell address and his warning to the nation and the storm that we are upon today. And we might probably have copies here, good. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, what we see right now is what was warned, warned of over 200 years ago because the Founding Fathers understood human nature. They understood every one of us here. Given the opportunity, we can be the, a shining example to the rest of the world. We can be a beacon of liberty that does not require force and violence to promote itself. But ladies and gentlemen, even as I say that, we are, we are a realist, not, not involved with the laboratory experiment. And we must have the capability to defend ourselves for there are people who are greedy, who have avarice in mind, who are corrupt, and who would do everything in their power to block our actions. If we are to bring freedom to the people of the world, which is really something that we can do with an olive branch, we had better first get our act together here. 
and do it right first. And we don't surrender the Constitution Bill of Rights to do that, but it still again comes down to interaction and we have to be involved. Imagine if you will, most people wonder, well, how is it we survived this long? And how is it that we got along, and myself included, John and myself, with what we were doing here? Ladies and gentlemen, we did it at the personal level. We didn't go looking for any big machinery or any big corporation. We did it at the personal level to virtually millions of you. There are many of you know that we are not concerned for our own personal, our, our own personal safety so much as the fact that you are informed. We have tread miles and miles again for that purpose. Well, you're going to have to do it now, too. At some point in time, we're going to be stopped here because there's only one other thing they can do to silence my mouth. And I will not shut up. And I refuse to shut up. In fact, how dare I, as Bill Clinton said, I'll dare to do it any time I want. If we pass in the process, it'll be a demonstration to my sons and my daughter that they shall stand to replace me when the time comes, and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. And somebody said, oh, Mark, we've got to tone it down. Why should we tone it down? Since obviously if they win, they're going to get the whole ball of wax. If the other side wins, ladies and gentlemen, notepads you hold in your hand aren't going to be worth the powder it takes to blow away, for you don't need 60 reporters when there's only one world government. You don't need 60 microphones, you need but one. Big Brother is not fascism. Big Brother is not communism. Big Brother is socialism, stretching on for as far as the mind can see. Imagine, if you will, a boot on the face of humanity forever. George Orwell. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he spoke that in many ways, not only in dissertations, but in his own books, which have been avoided now like the plague, or are, in, are properly, shall we say, modified if they're put into, on the screen. And even that quote is mutated intentionally because it doesn't give the proper perspective, does it? Now, I will say something about that that I'd argue. Communism is social communism, socialism. Fascism is national socialism. Socialism, as you know it, I call the smiley face with fangs, is Fabian socialism. And there is no difference between any three of those tyrannies. They are all the same. And some of you fought them in the last 70 years. Remember, we beat them to a bloody pulp and pushed them back. In some cases, they beat us to a bloody pulp and pushed us into the water. And then we had to come back screaming and kicking at, how, at a cost of how many men and women that you personally know. At a cost more now, perhaps, if we're not careful of how many brothers and sisters, if we are not very careful. And I still will say this. If this track continues, we will probably have to fight. And that makes everybody go Whip! right there, doesn't it? I can hear vinyl sucking up off these chairs in this room right now. <laughs> yeah. But I'm also, as I said, a realist, ladies and gentlemen, and we will do everything in our power. And you are obligated as Christians, as whatever you are, by the way, Jewish, Muslim, or whatever, if you are sworn to protect and defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, you are our friend. But if you propose to try and throw down those documents which are precious to us, then most assuredly you are our enemy for life. An old gentleman I knew many years ago, and he's passed on now, fought in the, in the uh, well, you might call it the, the Arab-Israeli War of 47 through that period. And years ago, before I knew anything about this, he made an interesting point. He said, Mark, they, and people know I use this quote quite a bit, they eat their young. I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, let me put it this way. Everybody in this room, for instance, is usable to the New World Order crowd, and when they're done, they will spit them out too. They will chew them up, and they will use whatever they can, and then drop them into the ash pile. We've already seen this how many times with industry, with NAFTA and with GATT, which we're all warned about, but everybody decided, let's just make a telephone call, let's just see what we can do here. Mr. Dole admitted openly, ladies and gentlemen, it's documented even by the press, that in opposition nine to one, he voted for it anyway. So you tell me who's listening right now. The only reason that the issues that you've seen brought up in the last six months became issues is not because of the couch potato who watches Roseanne big time wrestling and is busy with, busy with television and baseball. 
Those aren't the people they were worried about. Turn around and look at all the people in this room. These are the ones that they were worried about and why the contract with America came about. I'm going to challenge you to this because I watched Comrade uh, Koppel, you know, we call him Howdy Doody in our part of the country. <laughs> he asked a question that you should have all paid attention to during that public forum that took place in Decker, Michigan. It was a question about social engineering and the formula that hasn't worked. He said, well, didn't you just have a revolution? And didn't you guys just vote the buggers out? No, we didn't, and a lot of people started to realize that. And will you notice that as quickly as any crisis developed, this contract, all of the parts that were supposed to be in motion have been thrown to the wind? Whatever excuse could be found to try and move away from and to try and buy time for the new world order to entrench. Every month that we have waited, the other side has gone farther. Something that you all saw, and I want to pass this around while we're talking. You know what? This is what's really amazing. I can hand this around to people in this room just like I have $5 bills and $20 bills. And at Patriot meetings, even with 5,000 people in the room, this has been handled by tens and tens of thousands of people. Tell me you can do that at a rock concert. <laughs> Thank you. Please. But I'll explain this. Pass this around. And I want everybody to see it because this is part of the, the little things. You know, the little things we bought are proportion. That's a regional police car, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you have talked about regionalism for how many years? 20 and 30. I know men here have been gray talking about it. We're all crazy because it couldn't happen. That is a, it is a regional police car from York, Pennsylvania. We have photographs of them in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, in Illinois, and even in Michigan now, in Region 5. The New States of America Constitution is the issue that's going to be brought about, which states that the 50 states of the Union are abolished, the 10 regional governments of the New States of America are established. That's why the Conference of the States is in motion. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this all came from the crime bill. Yes, which one? That's what you'd have to ask next, right? Take your pick. Uh, omnibus crime package for last year. Not the one for 88, not the one for 90, not the one for 91. The one for, for this last year that passed. And we've all been told that we were going to, first we were going to let it pass and then we're going to take pieces back out. Why did you let it pass in the first place? Do you realize what kind of nonsense that is? Once you let legislation go into the system, it never leaves the books. Even if it's amended, it is always there waiting in the wings. Even prohibition, which most people said didn't work, mark my word on this, things like that have a tendency of coming back around. Prohibition is still on the books waiting to be amended at their discretion. And again, under the old checks and balance system, which is still in place but not being used, we weren't supposed to have this big bureaucracy we have now, were we? We were supposed to have a part-time government that we kicked on its butt every time it tried to stand up and rear its ugly head, and the state legislatures were supposed to make sure it happened. Let me read a little story about that, because if you put in perspective the understanding of government, remember that state senators were not originally elected, were they? Your state senators were ambassadors to the Fed, and the neutral ground where the Fed met was called Washington, D.C., and the reason it was created was not to hold the slaves in Washington, D.C. That's some of the new rewriting of history they're generating now. The purpose was that there would be a separate neutral ground that would put chains upon the Fed, so it would be very, very limited. What happened? through a series of modifications, some of them not even, not even properly ratified, we have seen a mutation towards tyranny. And I don't care what anybody says. When I can have Ms. Feinstein, from your state here, stand up on CNN and say, when we tax the American people 82%, and she said it with a straight face, everybody fell out of their chair, by the way. She said, when we tax them 82%, we'll be able to get so many more activities going and this and that and the other. Ladies and gentlemen, they're serious about this. Let me, all of you are about, uh, some of you are older, some of you are younger than my age, let me tell you how it will be. I'll take, you, know, you, you get one, I get 19. Should 5% appear too small, be thankful I don't take it all, because I'm the tax man. The wisdom of the Beatles, oh wow. Think about it. Well, that's right, we're now the post-revolutionaries. I guess everybody that said they never cut their hair, and now has got short hair because it's in style, remember? Yo, yeah, I remember that. I'll never cut my hair in my lifetime. How many times do you hear that from people you know that are now walking around with butches, huh? Yeah. Well, at least they're taking showers now, so it's okay. That's good. Well, it is serious, but let me, 
let me bring this forward, and there's an excellent piece back there that's done on parchment. And this has to do with the issue of people arguing back and forth about Christianity and this nation being found as a Christian nation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's because of our Christian philosophy that we have had the open-heartedness to offer this nation to so many other people, despite what everybody tries to be brain-screwed with. The fact of the matter is that were this any other nation, you would not see the end result that we have here with regard to the form of government and the type of people that we are. To ask a Christian not to say in the name of Jesus Christ is like asking a Muslim not to pray to Mecca and like asking a gentleman of the Jewish faith to take, take off his yarmulke because you think it insults, insults you. Would you do that to another person of another faith? Well, much in the same way, you do not apologize for your Christianity and, never, and, and you should never do that. I've had a lot of good friends, by the way, in my lifetime, and it's amazing how some of them put up with me. Because the fact of the matter is, as you might have noticed, I am a little bullheaded in certain categories. There's a reason for that, and I do have to thank my parents. I also have to appreciate all the people that have influenced my life, and that sometimes I didn't listen to for 20 years. I had an instructor years ago, and I want to relate this story because it's so important to where teachers are important, provided, again, you know, instead of garbage in, garbage out, they give you the proper input. The gentleman's name was Mr. Fairman, and I didn't know he was terminally ill at the time, but he was an excellent man. He was in junior high school. And he told me and everybody else in the classroom the first of the year in our history class, he said, Mark, and everybody else there present, because I was looking at as he's talking to me, he said, if anybody here is willing to memorize the Constitution of the Bill of Rights or the Declaration of Independence, then they can have an A for the rest of the year, and they don't have to crack a single book. And 33 kids were going, where's the Constitution in here? Real quick. And we all read parts of it. And we all tried for about a week. Boy, well, this is monotonous. Oh, my goodness. But you know what? And this is something that always struck me, even at the time when I didn't know what he was trying to do. Three people in that classroom stood up before the class and recited the Constitution and the Bill of Rights verbatim, word for word. And they were given so many hours to do it. At another point... Another person stood up and recited the complete Declaration of Independence as if he were one of the Founding Fathers, as I remember. That was inspirational even 20 years and 30 years later because to think back and realize the effort and then to understand what Mr. Fairman was trying to do as a teacher is so important now to me because we do him honor. And I will always do him honor for what he has done for me in the past. Again, he was a simple person and he was a very good man by what I understand and what I know of him. And I had a chance to experience part of his life. Well, some people have told me about that, this too, having to do with life, that oh, I'm going to do my own thing, and whatever happens here isn't going to affect me. Or oh, is that true? Let me challenge you to something, because I saw a young baby in somebody's arms over there. We already touched such a long timeline of history, and we do not fully appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen. And as I've said, some of you are gray-haired here today, and do never be, never be embarrassed and always be proud of every gray hair you got, because chances are we helped you get it, first of all. But fact of the matter is that many of you who are grandmothers and grandfathers right now can recall when your grandmother and grandfather were alive. Perhaps that was 20 years ago, perhaps that was 40 years ago. And you all learned something from that person, and you all touched their experiences. Many of them lived to be 60, 70, if you were blessed, perhaps 100, and you were part of their lives and how old are you now? All of you probably have grandchildren or cousins or whatever or nephews or nieces that you now affect. You have already touched on over 160 possible years of American history. And if you do it right, you will touch the future for another 80. God granted that the children that you now teach will live to be that old. You get to choose the future right now, so don't tell me that you do not have an effect on the nation. How well we do today determines how well they do, of course, in the future. Everybody's always tried to use that rhetoric, but never put it in perspective. It is a reflection of all of you. How well you do or how poorly you do. And I know there's boats, planes, trains, gambling, and a hundred other things to keep you busy, and that's why we've shut all of them off. 
because I finally realize, and gradually as you start to think, and as one woman said, and a hundred others have said afterwards, once you are awake, ladies and gentlemen, you can never go back to sleep. That's what the New World Order is afraid of, is that the world is not full of sleepers anymore. It's full of thinking, breathing Americans. And we challenge and we question. When I originally did a tape called American Peril, and by the way, we were jabbed and cajoled to do this because we had done a lot of work in the past. And by the way, American Peril is over two years old. It is now a future history past, as many of you know. With the coming discussion of the national ID card, and don't tell me it doesn't exist. It's even been put in the papers and the magazines now. Whoops. Two years after we discussed it, of course, there is now an open discussion that we have a need to surrender our freedom that we need a dog collar around our neck, woof, woof. That we are to be treated like livestock, cattle, sheep, or whatever term you wish to use, because we need to be kept track of. An FBI agent who was trying to be uh, rather repugnant, by the way, and there's one or two of them that are, trust me, I've, I've seen them in my history and over the years, one said, well, and I showed him the National ID card, and I challenged this, I said, this is what they're attempting. He said, well, it's okay, the rest of the world has it, we should too. Well, I'll tell you what, the rest of the world can be slaves if they want to. They've chosen their fate, or they've di unfortunately, they're under the wrong, the wrong situation at the right time. But ladies and gentlemen, we shall not surrender our freedom here. We will not accept the New World Order, and if need be, we will fight it. There's so many things, and this is what I had to do, was sit here and and try and decide, and I'll give honor to this man also because he's from, the World War, from World War I. His name is Robert D. Adams. A gentleman, I was handed a letter, and the gentleman could not be here today because of his activities with his church, and I appreciate that, and I honor him for that reason. What he discusses here, and I'll abbreviate it, is our lessons of history and why the militia is where it is. Because throughout history, there has been a need for, and the militia has never left the population of this nation. Contrary to popular belief, even if you don't like it, and even if you don't want to be a part of it, you are already a member of the unorganized militia under Title 10 of the United States Code, and that's the new one, updated and in the computers at this time. The militia is part of the check and balance system. At different times, it has had to rise up and demonstrate its authority by simply being there. And at different times, of course, it has been put on the shelf, partially because of the lackadaisical attitude of the people. Let me remind you of something I said earlier. You cannot win another man's freedom. Well, I will also say this. Don't expect a mercenary to fight for your freedom better than you can. And if you think so, then take a look at the wonderful little black ninja outfits that are going on all over the country right now and why it is that black is the color of choice. The money that you hold in your pocket right now that we call money is not, as you know, and is part of the Federal Reserve System. Part of what we talked about on our program is the gradual development of the new money or the new backed currency using the Deutsche Mark, the yen, with the American dollar as a subservient issue currency below them. But there is more to come beyond that because this is the first part of the world trade mechanism, and it is to bring America to its knees. The use of the foreign currencies specifically to strip wealth from the nation is not a new technique with fiat money. But I challenge you again to take a look at the contract you have in your pocket that you call currency. And I want you to read at the very top where it says Federal Reserve. I have a bill in my box here that I didn't bring out. Forgive me. I, I wasn't sure I wanted to touch on this yet, only because there were so many other things that are important. But this is important because this is another thing that affects all of you and why most people will listen, because it has to do with M-O-N-E-Y, or what you think is money. In 1963, we measured our debt in the millions. That's with an M. Today, we measure the national debt in the trillions in less than 30 years. Prior to that, take a look at the historical measurements of our national debt, and you tell me if something is not wrong. The fact of the matter is that when you're involved in fraud and you're seeing a spiraling mechanism or device like this developed, it is only a matter of time before the toilet flushes. And unfortunately, this Coriolis effect is pretty well down to the bottom. The head can now see its own tail. That is why you are seeing a gradual tightening now of a variety of different devices that before you had free access to. And of course, it is very easy to get a credit card, isn't it? Yes. 
Personally, I will say this, and, at the, and I'm not trying to offend anybody who might even be in the business, but all but one credit card should be destroyed and done away with. Cut them up. If you want to hurt the New World Order without using a weapon or without firing a shot, when you go home tonight, take all those credit cards you're playing with and all that debt and shred it and save money. Notice we didn't just say we are complaining about something, but there are some solutions, aren't they? And somebody say, well, what good am I? Well, what good are you? This is what you're good for. Demonstrating first, and if need be, taking action later at your discretion. You have the capability here to show the other side that you are not interested in their games, and that we do have the capability to be independent and free. But again, whose decision is it? Can Mark tell you all through this? Yes, I can recommend it, but you have to go home with the scissors and cut them up and shut them down. It is your interest that is making this system function the way it is, or dysfunction the way it is. It is part of the new chain and part of the links that are being formed in the manacles that are presently on our wrists and on our, and on our ankles. You get to decide. Will it be effective? Well, let me ask you something. I want one of you here, anybody, to show me what pink slip will drive the new world order from the United States. I want to see the piece of paper because one thing that has happened, as has already been demonstrated, ladies and gentlemen, is that contracts are not being honored. We already have a time-proven Constitution and Bill of Rights that specifically stipulate and limit the federal government, the state government, and all other mechanisms and grants all other authorities to who? You. And yet you have been conditioned and trained to believe it is the other way around. Yeah, the bottom line is we must do everything in our power, but the reason that the militia is there and why you are all part of it, even if you don't like it, by the way, and there's a reason for that, so that you have dissenting votes, so that tyranny will not prevail even in the militia. Oh, yeah, that's right. Or in the military, for instance. Well, you are going to have to be the input. You're going to have to be the deciding factor. You are going to again make the decision. I'm going to throw everything on you. When the time comes with the militia, hopefully it will not be needed, but if need be, we are there. I am not a, an individual leader of a command per se, but when the time comes, this suit will disappear and whatever clothes are necessary, I will don and I will commit myself. And if we do not return from this, then so be it. And in fact, as was sung in a song here, ladies and gentlemen, I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees as a slave. Now, one of the things about social engineering that's very important to understand, and for you Vietnam vets who were here, you went through this, is the structural and social engineering to pariah you and isolate you from the rest of the population. Because it is important to make sure that we have a professional force, quote unquote, with regard to the military. We have always had that. And by the way, the militia is not paramilitary. The ATF, the FBI, the DEA, and anybody else who's not a regular militia force is paramilitary. The militia is military. But it is, it is assuredly a necessary tool. What I talked about a moment ago here with regard to dissension, ladies and gentlemen, by having a widespread of the population involved in all of our activities, we have a wide number of views. Therefore, there are other checks and balances in place. And to try and deny that you have an obligation to be part of the physical defense of the nation is askew from the whole concept of participatory government. In fact, in the Second Amendment where it says a well-regulated militia, do you want to know, if you look at history, what regulated was all about? It wasn't a maximum cap. In other words, we're going to restrict what it is you own. That wasn't the case at all. The objective was that Americans, like everybody else, would become lazy, as they did in Europe and allow professional mercenary forces and professional forces to take the place of the yeomanry or the common population to defend themselves. They would buy somebody else. A little point in history that you might have forgotten. What about the American Civil War? Do you know that if you were drafted in the American Civil War, I could pay this man $65 and get him to go in my place? And that's in the Union Army? That's a little historical part they don't want to refer to. You could buy another person and throw them in your place. It could still be done today, theoretically. I've never checked to see if the laws have changed, and they probably haven't. 
What's the problem with that, though? As I said before, no man can win your freedom for you nor protect your household better than you can. No other person will hold your private property sacred as you will. And for you to claim that private property, for instance, is not important, is again a slap in the face of the very concept of the Constitution. Where a man's home is his castle, and even if it is a shed out of the back 40 here, up on the side of one of these mountains, the king cannot pass the threshold without permission. Remember that? Yes. We have forgotten so quickly. No-knock search warrants, house-to-house -house search and seizures, Yes, concentration camps beyond a shadow of a doubt. And let me tell you something, a little action here, which we documented in Columbus, Ohio, which we described in the original American Peril series, the original piece. In Columbus, Ohio, with 50 warrants and no more were available, they had nothing else they could serve, they went into Columbus, cordoned off whole quadrants of one parts of the city, went house to house, collected people, took them to the local fairgrounds, which, by the way, had all the barbed wire pointed the right way now because the government provided the money for it, they were processed there, helicopters were brought in, transported the prisoners to a site inside the Ohio State Trooper Police Academy where the Fed then processed them in the exact pattern we have described over and over and over again. And we have documented this and we brought the people to people's attention this on our radio program where nobody else touched it. And I challenge you, because this evidence is before us, and yes, they were after people who were black, by the way. Why didn't the press report that? They were, they were arrested and surrounded over three to 400 people and collected them, but they only had 50 warrants, by the way. Ah. What's good for the goose, as we say in our business, is good for the goosey. And eventually, ladies and gentlemen, they're going to decide that all of you are not politically correct or not right, too. Whether you, again, be holding a notepad, a microphone, or just be one of us common citizens out there. At some point in time, you may not quite do the right thing, or you're going to be in the wrong place at the right time. Well, who will come to your aid after you've thrown everybody else from the sleigh? Hmm? The militia is there for a purpose and for a reason. Not to stand in front of nor to stand behind, but to stand side by side with the American people as one of the liberty teeth that we have always possessed. And our first, and if you don't have it, you better have it, is a copy of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And your second is the coercive force in hand capable of defending yourself, your home, your community, and your nation when the time comes. That, more so than anything else, is important. There are so many things and oh, I wanted to say so many things here and I could have really taken off and I probably still will anyway, by the way. <laughs> don't think that I don't get pissed. <laughs> to see some of the outright lies that I did, including my family, my father, my wife. And I'll tell you something, I'm very proud of my wife, by the way, because of how much she's put up with, as some of you know. To be doing what we've done requires a woman who's very strong. And I will honor her also tonight and say that I'm glad that I found a woman who could put up with me. But let me give you a little hint at what the media did about two days ago. Do you know that my wife was in Oklahoma City the day of the bombing? Did you know that? Oh yes, that was one of the rumors that was started through the press mill that they were starting to generate. That my wife was in Oklahoma City the day of the bombing. We homeschool, by the way. We have four children. <laughs> what has been the attempt through the outright lies was to try and get us to go more on the defensive and hide. Am I hiding right now? Now, I will say this, that we will choose the time of our battles. We will choose the time that we fight with regard to action. And we also choose who we speak to, by the way. I like that about America. We can do that. But I will not suffer any more fiction. And I hope that you will not suffer any more fiction from these story mongers. I ask that you make the decision yourself again, just as with everything else that we've seen here tonight. It besmirches the very concept of the Constitution and freedom of speech. 
because again, if all else fails, apparently they are going to generate or continue to generate outright lies about you when they're done with this meeting tonight. I guarantee it. Can you imagine what's on the national media right now while you sit here? Thank you. CNN goes on every half hour, by the way. That's right, the Communist News Network. <laughs> Who I might add, the day that I was the most wanted person in America, had already talked to the sheriff several times and knew that it was not the case and ran the story for three days, knowing it was an outright lie. Truth in the media. Yeah. And I'm a Chinese jet pilot, too. <laughs> Well, I don't, that's not the insult Chinese jet pilots, because they're pretty scary when they're up there, too. Trust me, they're probably good men and women, too. I said women. There's probably some Chinese female jet pilots. Well, we get an opportunity and a chance. This is it. So from now on, we're going to present some form of battle plan for you. And this is where it's going to have to happen is now, from this point on. A lot of the fellow patriots that have been here tonight have been worried and afraid and concerned about what's going on and they've offered other solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to get up off your hind end and get behind them. But you also need to become a militiaman now, for you have no more time. That means that you have to understand the concept of the camaraderie of brothers and sisters in arms. We have been entrenched for quite a, quite a while doing what we're doing, facing the New World Order crowd with no resources, with no media per se, and the only media we have are you. Word of mouth, person to person. Well, now you need to stand up. Get behind these efforts, but also with an equal eye towards the possibility of having to defend yourself. Notice I haven't backed down on that, and I refuse to, because I am very concerned for all of your children, for your families when the time comes. You are going to be the best defense of the nation. A Marine Corps general asked me, as I pointed out earlier here to you also, he asked me after about seven hours of sitting down with him, he said, Mark, my forces can fight the New World Order, they can beat the New World Order, but their biggest concern is will the American people stand shoulder to shoulder with us to defend the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, because that's what he was sworn to. And I said, that's your decision. What is it? I know there's some old Marines out there too. I love Bulldogs. Especially if you're in the Army, we always put the Marines in front of us. <laughs> Remember that. No offense, we just know who works, who fights better sometimes. But I served with a lot of men in my, in my time, and a lot of women too. And ladies, I do not wish to insult you in any way, shape, or form. And I know there's a bunch of them probably screaming out front too, by the way. <laughs> oh, they went home. Okay, they're watching us on TV now, in some form, I imagine. Well, fact of the matter is that, ladies and gentlemen, I ask that the men of the Republic be allowed to do their job. For most assuredly, yes, I know that women can fight. Trust me, I've seen enough schoolroom brawls in my time. And the first thing I learned is to go for the earrings, by the way. <laughs> I know that trick. Well, anyway, the fact of the matter is, though, that we are men of the West, or at least men of the United States. We will do a very fine job of defending the Republic, but we ask that you do a fine job also of protecting the homeland and protecting the families that are here. That you allow us as men to do our job. And yes, if need be, don't worry. You'll be given the opportunity perhaps to defend your home when the time comes. But it is our task, and it is one of our purposes. So let us do it to the best of our ability. You, I ask one thing, because you've already seen how poorly anything else can be documented. I ask that you become the historians of our families and of our country. That if need be, and if I have to lay my life down for whatever purpose, or that your husband might, or that your son might, not that you discredit him and do him a disloyalty by cursing what happened, but rather explain to his posterity or to your children why it is that you are willing as men to stand against the new world order because of honor, because of your freedom, your liberty, and the understanding that if we don't do it, ladies and gentlemen, nobody else will. No one will. It's a long path that we're going to walk now with a lot of minefields, with a lot of barbed wire, and with we'll a few alligators nipping at our heels all the way through this. The exciting thing is, I wouldn't trade this for any other place to be. 
you know how many people offered me flights out of America, out of the United States, when somebody called in and said, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna hear any hands because I know what happened. But I had people calling me and said, Mark, I, we can get your family out of the United States now and you. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't, that was, I don't take it personally. I understand the concern, but in a way, I will not insult you. We cannot run. There is no place left to run. Almost every one of you at one time or another has a relative who ran here. Why? It's very straightforward because this is the land of opportunity. You don't get a second chance after this one. We could run to another part of the globe, no matter where it would be, but if we can't make it stick here, it isn't going to happen anywhere else. If we don't stand behind the Constitution and the Bill of Rights here, it isn't going to happen in Guatemala first. It isn't going to happen in Canada. They're already down the tubes. It isn't going to happen in Europe, Asia, or Africa if we don't first stand up here because you were born here. You're responsible for this piece of real estate as part of your birthright. You have a blessing that, and a little story here that relates to this is a woman, a couple, never met him before. They came forward, and the one woman, she was, she was very polite. She said they'd just come back from Moscow, and this is about a year ago. And I relate this several times to people to give you an understanding perspective of what you have. They had just come back from Moscow, and she said, Mark, you would not believe what happened. And she related this story that they got off the plane, they went to a taxi cab. They jumped in the taxi cab, and you know how taxi drivers are. They want to talk, right? They want to keep entertained while you don't pay any attention to the meter that's running twice as long as it should, right? Well, in the process, what did he talk about? Sports? Soccer? Baseball? No. This man started into a diatribe about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. He started asking this, this couple, well, gee, you're from America. What do you think about, what do you think about the idea of, of, of gold and silver as currency? What do you think about the First Amendment? What do you think about the Second Amendment? We're going to have weapons ourselves here if I have my way. Da, 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 da. Right on down through all the different par parts of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, talking about the Declaration of Independence. And you know what? They were embarrassed for the whole ride. He was, he was literally reciting word and verse of the Constitution. He knew it by heart. He wasn't looking at a script. Here were two people born with a birthright so precious that many of the people of the world are trying to find it. And when they were done, they realized when they got out of the taxi how little they knew. And they were born here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we get a chance, as I said again. And she came back, she said, from that point on, I was so embarrassed that we immersed ourselves in law and the Constitution and understand who we are and what we have here. And just as so many other times I've heard it, she said, Mark, now I cannot go back to sleep again. Now, since then, the doors to Russia have been kind of closed. And if they aren't, well, then you know what we ought to do? We ought to start a new program, too, for the Patriot Movement. Here's one for you that's cheap. Why don't we buy 10 million pocket copies of the Constitution, send emissaries to Russia, and for a minimal pittance, have them spread the word of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights across Russia? Because the fact of the matter is, if you tried it, they'd stop you butt cold in your tracks. That's right, thank you. What we need to do, but what we need to do is press this issue, because here is a challenge, isn't it? I would rather not fight anybody if I can help it, ladies and gentlemen. You do not understand my demeanor. And it would, not, it would take too much time to explain how I got to where I'm standing in these shoes right now. This is a person who many years ago told you, told me that even when I was younger, I was not going to go into the army or I was not going to go in the military. I did not get drafted. I volunteered. That's right. Work at somebody long enough and you can probably talk in anything. And I wasn't really recruited either. I just found the right place, the right niche at the right time. But ladies, yes, ladies and gentlemen, here's an opportunity. And here again is a solution. Let's present the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, in its proper form to the rest of the world, and let's offer them an olive branch. Do you think our government would let that happen? Do you think the New World Order is going to want that? Because, again, we're not promoting socialism, fascism, or communism. We're supporting our form of government, a limited republic. When was the last time you even heard a Republican call this a republic? Thank you. As you know, we said the pledge, and it wasn't to a democracy. As you know, in the Constitution, it also states that we will guarantee to every state a Republican form of government. And that doesn't mean party. What that means is a form of government. Well, we're challenged again. 
What we need to do now is we must find our own level. For each one of you, there is a point at which you will stop. And don't say that all oh, fight to the last drop of my blood. Well, I'll tell you what, that may be true for some of you. But I want you to all ask yourself personally to what level you're willing to work, and I want you to reach and achieve that level and then exceed it. Every one of you, to ask yourself tonight when you go home, and yes, to talk to your wife, and even to talk to your kids. I do this with my own children for that reason. When the time comes, you're going to have to make a terrible decision, perhaps, and what it means is you may have to walk away from your wife and your family when the time comes. When that, ha when that happens, I hope you've planted the proper seeds and you make sure that they're watered well so that when you do or if you do fall, they replace you. That is the very purpose behind having children, not so the state can own them for eight hours a day and indoctrinate them to their technique and to their dogma. No, 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 no. In fact, that's very reminiscent by the time you're done, if you review it, of the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto, a government-sponsored cool school system. Fool system? I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's not to insult any teachers here, because I know that many of you are trying, and especially if you're here, chances are you're with the Patriot Movement, and you know you're fighting an uphill battle, and you're fighting a battle from where perhaps it should be fought inside. But you're fighting a holding action, and we eventually wish to go on the offensive with our minds. That means we have to start taking ground. And the best thing again to do is communications again and again and again. Will we win immediately? Now let me explain to you some policy that I've espoused for how long, and all of you know it, we may not win in our lifetime. We have to start thinking in terms of five years, ten years, half century, and century. Our opposition thinks that way. As I said before, you touch 160 plus years of American history with your life as it exists today. Maybe more. The amount of time spent here. You are going to affect this nation for a long, long time to come, and now you have the opportunity to do it. So I'll put it in your hands. A long time ago, a man said, I, have but I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Well, I guess that's the exact attitude I'll take right now. I regret that I have but one because I wish I could give you ten more. We need help in that area too, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why you need to get out and you need to speak because we can't be everywhere, and eventually I think we will be silenced. It's only a matter of time, and death comes to all of us. But if that's the case, and if that seems to be your fear, I will remind you that it does come to all of us eventually. How we meet life in the meantime, and whether or not we truly are free, both here and here and here, is decided by each one of us. I've known some good or great men in my time that are not with us now that I wish to God were here to speak to you. People that have influenced me in such a way, and no, they weren't racist, and they weren't in any way, shape, or form, quote-unquote, hate mongers, just the reverse. They were great men, and there are still great men today, even though they've passed on. To insult the American people, to try and be ashamed of our birthright, and to be afraid and ashamed of our Constitution and Bill of Rights, will help you identify your enemies. Don't ever forget that. If there's one thing that we can do now, ladies and gentlemen, it is going to be, perhaps first, as a friend of mine said, to act as if everything depended upon us and to pray because it all depends upon God. I will address a few things too, by the way, before we, before we close here, and I don't think we have that much time. One of the things that I've seen that really amazes me is how now by the situation that took place in Oklahoma, we can belittle the people who were butchered in Waco. Have you noticed how that's being attempted? I think everybody's catching on to that very quickly. How because of the terrible, the terrible tragedy that took place, we need to surrender something. No, we don't. How unfortunately, with all the facts, and I have a real problem with all of the chain of events that I saw, number one, and the same thing that an FBI agent said, is the way that the prisoners were handled. And I watched the media butcher what I said so many times over that I'm going to express to you my feelings about this. I have had the unfortunate accident of actually being in witness protection at one time or another, back when I worked with the, with the uh, Army. Not by choice, but by accident. It was a situation. If I would have handled my witnesses 
the way these witnesses were handled in the first several days, my ass would be grass and the lawnmower would have gone through it. That would have been a bottom line fact. In fact, we talked to an FBI agent and more than one, and I asked him, I said, don't you think that the way they handled them was a lot like, and he said, don't say it, just like Lee Harvey Oswald. That's from the inside, not from the outside. There's a basic rule, dead men tell no tales, as we know. And the last thing I would do with a witness is dress him up in a pumpkin suit, walk him 100 feet from a building to a vehicle on a downward slope, and expect him probably to live. They're lucky nothing happened, especially with the jeers of people who hate him in the background. You have mafia kingpins and people of all ilk that you can imagine that are being held every day, and they go from the building to the vehicle, from the vehicle to the aircraft, from the aircraft to the vehicle to the building again, just like that. You never see them. You never even know which vehicle they're in. Now, what really bothered me is watching what happened at the other end of Oklahoma. When they got into Oklahoma City, where they were keeping the person, they had the pathway illuminated, and they had the man under spotlights. The only thing I'd know if I were holding his arm is where the bullet hole was when I heard the bang. Now, you tell me if that makes any sense. And by the way, here's another thing I don't want to hear any more about, bulletproof vests. Have you ever been shot wearing a bulletproof vest? There is no such thing as bulletproof. And to parade these witnesses around, even with the fictitious protection that they were putting on them, is nonsense. They should never have been seen. If you want somebody to see them, put them behind a one-inch Lexan glass panel, let somebody take some pictures, and get on with your work. Now, another thing I don't want to hear is, well, you know, maybe they made mistakes. Ladies and gentlemen, these aren't people that sell donuts for a living and decide to be an FBI agent today. These are trained professionals. Remember that word? Remember that's why you hired them? Some people have used that as an excuse for having them. These are trained professionals. They do this for a living. It is not a part-time job. It's like the same excuse for Waco, Texas. Well, you know, they made a few mistakes. If I had employees and I had a business like that that was killing people left and right, they'd be fired real quick, wouldn't they? The same can be said for the Weaver situation, which again, I've seen this go from separatist to, uh, to racist to everything else you can imagine. Bottom line is that the press has manipulated or altered the title accordingly at their discretion. But one thing, I save all the other literature that we do get given to us. And by the way, I don't buy Time Magazine. I've got a dental office for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Procure if you can. There's no sense in buying. But, well, for that, yeah, I know, I give it back when we're done. We photocopied, it's okay. The fact of the matter is there are too many questions that go unanswered. You've already heard about the discussions of the type of device, and that is a technical question that still needs to be resolved. One of the other problems I have is with the whole way that the first suspect was collected, and for any of the law enforcement would know this to be a fact, you've got a man who supposedly just capped off a bomb and killed how many people he doesn't know. He gets pulled over by a single law enforcement officer, and he's armed, and he does not resist. Wait a minute, look into my eye. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't care. Anybody out there uh, who's in law enforcement, describe the last time you had an incident with, who, with somebody who was really vicious and a murderer. They really, really, really don't want to be picked up. Trust me. They have a tendency to be a tad aggressive. So the whole scenario doesn't fit, and there are many other questions. Now, somebody asked me, well, do you think the government might have done it? Well, let me put it this way. When I was in the military, I was taught to start with a big zero. No pre-assumptions. But right now, as was, as was mentioned earlier, the first consideration is this, who profited from the action? Bill Clinton did, because almost as quickly, even as if the legislation was waiting in the wings, they proposed the idea that we get rid of all kinds of interesting things in the United States, not the least of which would be the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But beyond that, what about passe comitatus? You know, you and I in the Patriot Movement are all crazy for talking about passe comitatus. He talked about it on national television, didn't he? And what did he say about passe comitatus, that we have to do away with it? Not that he was going to sign it off. Now, I got into this with several people. Let me explain something. What Posse Comitatus does is put a chain upon the executive. The president can use military force inside the United States, but he has to sign a piece of paper, put down the purpose for it, and he is limited in the number of days he can attempt to do this. 
if he attempts to go beyond the limitations or if the Congress and the Senate deem that there is not an acceptable purpose for it, ladies and gentlemen, then he cannot get away with it. And he's also restricted if he attempts to go beyond the original guidelines. And the other thing that the problem with this is, and why I think Clinton doesn't like it and wants to do away with Posse Comitatus, because his name is on the bottom of a sheet of paper, and if he violates that code, he goes to jail. That's why. The bottom line, that's right, it would never happen for a different reason, because once we lose all of these checks and balances, it's going to come down to a terrible situation, as I said, and a decision. Why do all of you, let me ask you this, how many of you think right now we should drop Posse Comitatus? Anybody? Thank you. Now if you do, do you understand that what that means is the military becomes the police? That is the bottom line to all of this. The military becomes the police. I've been in the military. Some of you are in the military right now, they're here, and I don't even want to know who you are. But would you really want that? Daddy didn't train no fool, and I wasn't, gro I wasn't grown yesterday. Didn't just fall off the turnip truck, as they say. The bottom line to this, ladies and gentlemen, is again, they were trying to use whatever they could as quickly as possible. And I will say this now as to why. The New World Order crowd is behind in their timeline. The reason all the stops were pulled out with all of the media and everything else is because this is the most crucial time in American history going all the way back to the American Revolution. You are living history right now. The biggest problem, and I'll remind you again what Ted Koppel asked, and it was one of the questions he wanted to get out there right away is, well, what went wrong? Why is it the contract of America didn't put you all back in your seats and put you back to sleep? He was asking a social engineering question to a population group that was typical of many parts of the country. And what they were trying to find out is why the scam didn't work. Ah. And he did it on national television because they wanted to see what kind of response. Remember, input in, feedback. Take the feedback, and, and enhance the formula, throw the cartridge back in, and come up with a progressive solution to see how to retune the machine. That's what this is all about. As I said before, Daddy didn't train no fool. Unfortunately, a lot of you out there had the same, I think, uh, end result with regard to a solution, what was going on. Now, I'll say this, I've been kind of in the epicenter of this catastrophe for the last 12 days, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Being the most wanted man in America, second only to Timothy McVeigh, but I would understand. Second only, well, second most wanted man, that's true. Second most wanted man in America, you would think that I would have seen just about anything in the way of hatred for the patriot movement that you could imagine, right? Now, I will tell you flat out, of all the, television, the radio programs that we've done, and by the way, we do live programs, so there's no editing, okay? Of all those programs, of all the call-ins, we had one call out of hundreds that brought, or came in that was even somewhat negative. One. Mind you, we did calls in Florida. We did, we, did, we did programs in Michigan. We did programs all over the country here in the last six days. Don't you think that I would have seen a pretty good cross-section of what all was happening with regard to viewer listening audience and I haven't seen any of it. Let me tell you something else that the press did for me. It made my the people that I've worked with for how many years say thank you Mark, now we understand. Better than half my staff are black, the other half, of my, as I said, I've got people from who are Hispanic, people who are black and white people and everybody else you can imagine in between and yes men and women. And what it did is it convinced them of what I've been trying to talk to them about. And I don't rant and rave and I don't argue per se. If I find somebody who listen, I'll talk to them. If not, I got other people to talk to. Amazingly enough, all of the people that have been kind of iffy for years have turned around and now fully understand what this game is all about. That is the fact of the matter. And I'm in the middle of ground zero. So you have a golden opportunity here because people are asking questions now and you're the solution because otherwise they're not listening to the other problems. When I say problems, you know what I mean. It is now the time for Americans to stand shoulder to shoulder. As they said, if the muskox can do it, I think we can too. There's a little less gray matter there that functions. But now is the time, not later. To hesitate is to lose. Another little motto I put in front of the desk that every morning, no matter how blurry-eyed or tired I am, I read is, on the plains of hesitation lie the blackened bones of countless millions 
who at the dawn of victory sat down to rest and resting died. We sit at a very interesting threshold. If you wish to find a peaceful solution, then don't sit on your hind end much longer. If you must, in fact, in one form or another, decide to express yourself with pen, the time to do it is now. If you're going to call somebody, you better get on the phone now. Don't wait two days, because I know it'll happen when you walk away from here. Well, you know, Mark said, and uh, yeah, I remember it was a week ago, and I don't think it's that important now. Now is the time. And you are so important, and you are so crucial, because again, as I said, eventually these old bones are going to rest, and we get to pass the flag on again. I hope with my goals, and if you want to know what my vision is, what my personal vision is, is this. By preserving the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, ladies and gentlemen, with all of you together, that we can peaceably present our form of government to the rest of the world, and if the New World Order were shunted aside properly, there's not a people that wouldn't accept it because it is a just form of government, and this is a great nation. Our 10-year goal for America is very straightforward. Do you wish to be free 10 years from now or a slave? Free. 50 years from now, handing this nation over to your children, where do you want this nation to be free or a slave? Free. 100 years from now, this nation will stand, not may stand, will stand upon your strength. And where do you wish this nation to be? then I imagine that's what will happen, provided you stick to your words. One thing about Americans is this. We are kind of lackadaisical. In fact, I like to call it being hobbitized. But we might also remember that at least one or two other nations in the past have risen up and tried to face us, thinking that we were the hobbits of the planet, and instead found out we were the teddy bears with teeth, as you all know. That mistake has been made again and we won't make it in our lifetime. And ladies and gentlemen, if you were in the, in, in the Great War, World War II, or if you were in Vietnam, or if you were in Korea, your nation's going to call on you again. And I know the words that are going through your mind. I've already done this once. I've spent my time. I deserve a rest. Ladies and gentlemen, with freedom, there is no rest. With liberty, there is no respite. You don't get that opportunity. We get one shot at this. We have a very limited amount of time to do it in. We're only on this planet for so long, and I expect to pass it to everybody else when the time comes. But I ask you now, do it today. Now, how much time do we have? Well, I'll tell you what. How many of you here know how we close our meetings? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll ask you to join with me because all of you together, and I'll give you a little hint, and I'll say it quietly. God bless the Republic death of the new world order, we shall prevail. Now I'll ask you together to join me. God bless the Republic! Death of the new world order, we shall prevail. Thank you.